We interrupt this programming to bring you a message from Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak and an update on COVID-19. Let's listen in. Good afternoon. Thank you for being with, here with me this afternoon for this important update. I want to note up front that my remarks today may be a little bit longer than normal. I want to be clear and fully lay out for you the situation our state is now facing. We are at a critical point, and I want all Nevadans to understand why. I wanted to start by highlighting some encouraging news on the vaccine front. On Friday night, the FDA granted emergency use authorization of the Pfizer vaccine, and this morning, the Western States panel tasked with reviewing the vaccine signed off as well. We anticipate receiving the first shipment in the state on Monday, and the state team has worked closely with our partners and plans are in place to distribute the first allocation of the Pfizer vaccine to our frontline healthcare workers for immediate vaccination and staff and residents in our nursing skilled facilities as soon as possible. I know last week our state team did a test run of the distribution process with the people who will be responsible for transporting the actual vaccines across the state did a practice run to make sure everything goes smoothly. As new developments on the vaccine and the vaccination process unfold, we will work to keep Nevadans posted on any updates and news as they become available. As you all know, Dr. Fauci predicted that Thanksgiving would cause a surge on top of a surge. We have every indication that's where the nation and where Nevada is headed at this time. According to state health officials, we are just now beginning to see the effects of the holiday in our current data. As we expected, what appeared to be a brief decline in new cases over the holiday was related to decreased testing over the holiday. It certainly was not because COVID was magically gone. We continue to see an increase in hospitalization statewide with almost 1,700 Nevadans in the hospital battling COVID as of Friday while rural and Northern Nevada are still experiencing very high levels of COVID hospitalization, declines are beginning to be noticeable. In Southern Nevada, hospitalizations have yet to peak as the area remains in the midst of their third hospitalization wave. As you well know, helping to protect our healthcare infrastructure has been one of our main goals in our response efforts. I want every Nevadan to have access to care and our healthcare workers have done everything in their power, including setting up hospitals and parking garages to make sure that they are there for you when you need it, whether you have a heart attack, you're breaking arm, or you catch the flu. There is no doubt our hospitals are feeling an increase strain due to an increase in COVID patients, and our healthcare workers are too. They need your help. They deserve your thanks. Most concerningly, COVID deaths are on the rise. We have now lost 2,539 Nevadans to this virus. 2,539 Nevadans. As you know, almost three weeks ago, Nevada entered a statewide pause in the face of increasing COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. This statewide pause implemented incredibly strict mitigation measures in an effort to protect both lives and protect our fragile economy. Under this pause, capacity is limited to 25% at many businesses, including our restaurants, bars, casino floors, and gyms. Additionally, public gatherings are capped at 50 individuals or 25% capacity, whichever is less. And private residential gatherings are limited to 10 people maximum from no more than two households. I spoke recently about how we must create a bridge between our current situation and when the COVID-19 vaccines become widely available. You all know the tools to get us across the bridge. Avoid gatherings, limit exposure by staying home as much as you can, wash your hands, wear your mask. In fact, in a report from IHME at the University of Washington, they estimated that as of November 30th, 74% of Nevadans always wore a mask when leaving their home. More importantly, 
The report noted that if we got that number to 95% compliance, we could potentially save a thousand lives by April 1st. I know the mitigation restrictions in place under the current pause are devastating to many Nevadans who just want to go back to normal, who are worried about their jobs, their businesses, keeping their homes, and getting the kids back in school. But as I've said for nine months now, we must do what we can to protect the health and safety of the public. That remains more important than ever as we experience these record numbers. That's why today I am announcing that we will be extending the restrictions in the pause under the current pause in place under the current pause in Nevada for the next month through January 15th. We will be extending the restrictions in the current pause through January 15th. As always, we will be monitoring and evaluating our current situation day to day and week by week. We we'll remain under the current restrictions for now with the goal of getting through the next month due to the reasons I'll outline in a moment. But I need to be clear. If officials and experts agree that our trends are going beyond our ability to respond, I will be forced to come in front of you all again with tougher actions. I believe we can avoid those actions if we all commit to it. And before I outline the reasons behind this choice, I'd like to announce one more public health mitigation measure, something that will greatly assist in keeping Nevadans in the safest place they can be in their homes. Tomorrow, I will sign a directive that will place a moratorium on most residential evictions in Nevada with the effective date and time of 12.01 a.m. on December 15th. I originally put a residential eviction moratorium in place early stages of the pandemic in conjunction with the stay at home order. Keeping Nevadans in their homes to slow COVID-19 was safer then than making emergency shelter housing or shelter arrangements, which increases the risk of spreading COVID-19 for them. That still remains true today. We transitioned out of the moratorium as numbers improved and as tenant assistance programs came online. However, as we are now in the depths of our most significant and dangerous surge of this crisis, and with an impending deadline to be able to use federal assistance for tenants, I must reinstate a moratorium to ensure Nevadans can stay in their homes during this critical phase of the pandemic. When people are evicted, it is impossible to stay home. They're out looking for jobs and housing to desperately save their families. They will spread COVID-19 unintentionally because they have no options. The CDC and state public health officials have expressed concern over families and individuals that are being evicted. In fact, my COVID-19 medical advisory team has formally recommended reinstatement of an eviction moratorium to reduce increased community transmission that is caused by displacement and homelessness in Nevada. According to our state health officials, when people are evicted, they're at a higher risk of getting COVID-19 as families may be forced to share a smaller space or live in crowded shelters. Local officials are also concerned with the possibility of our shelters and other congregate housing options being overrun with homeless families. This is a reality we cannot afford to risk at this time. During this current surge, we are experiencing, it is critical that we do all we can to keep Nevadans in their homes and mitigate the risk of spread and infection. As I've been clear from the start, this moratorium does not, repeat, it does not relieve renters from their obligation to pay rent to their landlords. The state has already created and provided lease addendums where landlords and tenants can work on repayment solutions together. The moratorium will apply to all tenants unable to pay rent and will extend through March 31st. It will not prohibit certain evictions, including, for example, lease breaches for things like unlawful activity or nuisance. We also have rental assistance programs up and running throughout the state, so renters can have some of their outstanding rent for 2020 paid. However, these programs are supported with federal assistance dollars that currently expire at the end of December. That's this month. And we need to ensure that there are protections for tenants going forward. 
I recognize that this extension will be economically hard on some of our landlords. I know I've asked landlords to sacrifice during this pandemic. And I'm asking you to again do more for a few months so that we can push through what I hope is the last surge of this virus. I will do everything I can do to continue to push for economic assistance for our impacted landlords. This is one of dozens of areas of economic assistance that we are hopeful that the federal government will help provide. With the extension of this pause, the evictions moratorium, the cooperation of Nevadans, and a vaccine on the horizon, I am hopeful we can continue to stand together in this fight against the virus. We are fighting the virus. We cannot fight one another. There isn't a day that goes by when I don't think about the great balancing act that Nevada faces. And I know how the, how the tightrope that we must walk is more pronounced here than in any other state due to our economic structure. I want you to know that I see what you see. On one hand, we have record cases and our hospitals are under increased strain due to COVID. On the other hand, our families are suffering economically with unemployment rate remaining in the top two highest in the country and little remaining assistance available. Some say we've gone too far. Some say we aren't doing enough. I understand both sides. The last nine months have been full of decisions with no winning options, leaving us to determine which choice would lessen the blow the most. I know that, and you all know that. But early last week, I received a report from the White House COVID Task Force, which included recommendations for mitigating the spread. It became clear to me that the federal government has yet to grasp what is so evident to all of us here in Nevada about the complexities of our current situation. One of their recommendations said this, despite the severity of this surge and the threat to the hospital systems, many state and local governments are not implementing the same mitigation policies that stem the tide. That must happen now. That is a very stark departure from their message and actions over the last nine months that contradicted and undermined recommended mitigation measures touted by respected public health officials throughout the country. But nonetheless, I agree with them. The problem we have is the mitigation policy that most successfully stemmed the tide in Nevada was our complete shutdown. For the White House and feds to send that recommendation without including a big check for Nevadans, a plan for providing our state with funding to give our families a safety net in this time of great tribulation is downright out of touch and offensive. A shutdown is unrealistic without additional support. And I realize I owe to all those Nevadans who may be monitoring our COVID trends right now and wondering why I don't move in that direction. So let me explain. I've said repeatedly that we are trying desperately to balance public health and the impacts to our economy. But I wanna be clear about what I mean when I say economy. What I mean is impacts to our families, their ability to feed themselves and their kids, to keep the lights on, to keep a roof over their heads, to earn a paycheck, and to keep their benefits that allows them access to healthcare. And right now, our families and countless Nevadans are teetering on the brink. In our first months of the pandemic, Nevada lost 250,000 jobs, a quarter of a million jobs, reaching an unemployment rate of 30.1% the highest level ever reported by any state in modern history. For reference, during the Great Recession, Nevada lost approximately 180,000 jobs over nearly three years. Unemployment benefits are established for a full year. And due to the pandemic, nearly 142,000 Nevadans have completely exhausted that eligibility, with the vast majority unable to file again until mid-March 2021 or later. Let me repeat that. Without additional federal assistance, the majority of these 142,000 Nevadans will have no further unemployment benefits available to them from the state or federal government to support their lost income. This is a stark difference from the spring when the additional assistance of the federal government helped many of Nevada's most vulnerable workers displaced by COVID receive unemployment benefits that replaced roughly 100% of their lost income. 
that reality no longer exists. In the spring, at the time Nevada and states across the country were under stay-at-home orders, many individuals, families, and businesses had savings accounts that helped them hold on and helped them hold over. The state of Nevada had a savings account too, our rainy day fund. We had just received robust federal support that provided income replacement to individuals and gave state and local governments funding to provide a safety net. As of today, none of those things exist. Personal savings accounts have been depleted. The state emptied its rainy day fund in the spring to address our massive budget deficit. The funding we received from the Federal CARES Act is set to expire at the end of this year. Being the programs created by state and local governments to assist the Vans directly will have to stop in a couple of weeks. According to one of our state economists, to return to full stay-at-home restrictions without the savings and assistance we had in the spring would put us in a position that would be as bad or worse than the Great Depression. That means a return to historic unemployment numbers and a significant demand for public assistance with no funds to pay for it. If we could write a check to every Nevadan right now to provide them the ability to stay home and stop the spread, I'd do it, but we can't. Now I wanna talk bluntly about gaming and hospitality for a minute. I know it's hard for Nevadans to reconcile while some areas of our economy and public life are restricted while the state's casinos are open. I get why it's hard to reconcile that fact. And I wanna talk honestly with you. The gaming industry is under the same restrictions as many of our small businesses. And in some cases, even tougher restrictions. Restaurants and bars and casinos face the same capacity limits as those in our neighborhoods. Gaming floors have been reduced to 25% capacity as well. In fact, under the authority of the Gaming Control Board, the gaming industry is arguably the most regulated industry in the state. They hold privileged licenses. They must follow strict mitigation directives and face tough consequences if they don't. And I think it's important to make this 100% clear. When I think of the gaming industry, I'm not losing sleep at night because I'm worried about their stock prices or whether gaming executives are gonna make it through the pandemic and be able to keep a roof over their heads. I lose sleep at night because when we were under a stay at home order in the spring, we lost a quarter of a million jobs in three months in this state. And that's largely due to casinos being closed for 78 days straight. I'm thinking of our blackjack dealers, our cooks, our valet drivers, our housekeepers and our performers. They're what makes our amazing hospitality industry, which makes up one of the largest shares of workers in our state. That's why I worked with our legislature, our employers, our labor unions, and workers to pass the strongest hospitality COVID protection in the nation. These are the folks we're fighting to protect. It's the hundreds of thousands of Nevadans who take pride. They take pride in showing up every day for work and their ability to give them to provide for their families. If we take that away, the bottom falls out for our entire state. The numbers I walked through a moment ago prove that. And here's why else gaming matters in this state and what the White House doesn't seem to understand. If this has to shut down again, the state loses an estimated $52 million in gaming tax revenue a month. $52 million a month in tax revenue. That doesn't include room taxes, live entertainment taxes, and more. And when I say revenue, I mean the money that the state has to give to use for direct assistance to Nevadans in the form of schools, public and mental health, food banks, and more. It helps fund the critical services we rely on, the safety net Nevadans need. That's why it is devastated through this pandemic. I wanna remind you all, when I first entered office and put together a budget for 2019 legislative session, that was our first time in 10 years that our state recovered, that our state budget reflected recovery from the Great Recession. It took 10 years for the state and Nevadans to claw back from that. I am so grateful to our former governor, Brian Sandoval, and all the Nevada residents who worked so hard during this time to get us there. Because of that 10 year recovery, I was able to include the largest amount of funding for mental health services in the state's history, among other achievements. But it took 10 years. And here we are now at another inflection point. 
I certainly don't want to lose another 10 years or more trying to claw back where we were prior to the pandemic. So when I talk to you about what the state is going to do and about revenue and about unemployment or safety, it is not lost on me that the decisions we make today and how we handle this balancing act right now will have generational impacts. The decisions I make and all of you make in the coming months will determine how we're going to recover over the next decade or more. And this balancing act includes factors that too often get lost in the larger debate, but are just as important to consider. It's always things that we don't always hear about. This week, it was reported that Nevada has seen a 50% increase in opioid and fentanyl involved drug overdose deaths from the first quarter to the second quarter of 2020. That's startling. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it's happening in the middle of this pandemic. I could go on and on, and I know you could too. Prioritizing, prioritizing our economy or our health is a false choice for our state. If you don't have a job, if you can't provide for your family, if you lose your home, if the state has no safety net to help, people will not be healthy. These aren't binary choices. This is incredibly complex, and I think about it every day. I have never and never will deny the severity of this virus. This virus posed a threat unlike anything we have seen before. And for the last nine months, I've consistently explained the risk we are under. I've relied on the science. I've listened to public health officials. Like many other Nevadans, I wake up in the morning thinking about COVID-19. It's the last thing I think about at night. It is constantly on my mind. The loss of life is devastating. So many families have been forever changed because of this terrible impacts of this virus. The stress on our healthcare workers is unbearable. They've continued to show up every day in these trying situations to help their fellow Nevadans. So when I read the White House reports that say states and local governments aren't doing enough, you can imagine how my blood boils. More than nine months ago, the federal government handed the states the responsibility of dealing with this global pandemic. They told the states to deal with it, so we did. We have navigated this pandemic through strong state-to-state -state partnerships, through shared sacrifice, and through the grit and perseverance of our communities. You all stepped up, including the private sector task force, who secured millions of masks, gloves, gowns, and tests using their international relationships and supply chain because we weren't getting enough from the life-saving resources from Washington, DC. For nine months, the state has been on the front line of this war against COVID. And for nine months, we've heard that reinforcements and air cover are on the way. Just hang in there. We don't see any planes flying overhead. Instead, every day, I wake up to a new headline about those in charge in Washington, DC, aren't able to compromise on getting desperately needed funds to states because Republicans want business liability and Democrats want direct and flexible funding to state and local governments. I don't understand why there's a general philosophical objection to funding state and local governments. Because again, this money goes out directly to those who are suffering. And if Senator McConnell doesn't think people need assistance, he has an open invitation for me to come to Nevada anytime, to walk through the halls of our hospital COVID units, visit a homeless shelter that's full of families at a home that had a home just a month ago. When he opposes money for state and local governments, he opposes money for food, for unemployment, for health care. If Washington, D.C. needs some guidance on how to reach a compromise, look no further than Nevada. Nevada managed to pass a business liability and worker safety protection program this summer with support of both parties. We did it with workers, labor unions, major employers and government officials, all coming to the virtual table. Both sides knew we might not love everything in here, but we all said, we're gonna do this because we're gonna protect Nevada in this moment. It's not easy. Compromise often seems to be the hardest path, but we prove it's possible if you throw the politics to the side and prioritize people. I hope and pray that Congress listens to us and our federal delegation who are fighting for more funding for our state. But if we've learned anything over the last nine months, 
said, we have to figure out how to get through this on our own. If we don't, then we lead to further restrictions that decimate our economy for generations, or we continue the down this path of massive loss of public health. There's some hope on the horizon. As I mentioned earlier, we know the vaccine is on the way. And there's always some hope that we could get additional funding from the federal government. But as of right now, neither of those things exist. So in the absence of this leadership and support, I have made the best decision for our state and the continuation of the current restrictions implemented during this pause. I believe that we can all work together to make sure we maximize the benefits of these mitigation measures. And I call upon all of you to join in helping our state make it through this. And I don't say this is a threat, but as a reflection of the precarious position we're in at this time. If we cannot work together to bring these numbers under control over the next month, I will be forced to come before you again with tougher actions. So in this moment, amidst a dire economic situation, the surge of the virus, we all remain on the front lines of this battle, tired, worn out, and wanting to throw in the towel. We have a choice. We can look to our neighbors, to the left and to the right, and say every man and woman for themselves. Or we can look at our fellow Nevadans and say, I'm going to have your back and know that you'll have mine. We are all we have at this moment. If we want to avoid another Great Depression, avoid preventable deaths, and stop the overwhelming of our hospitals while our healthcare workers are literally crying for help, then we will rise to this occasion and fight. A lot of folks have been talking about the American people, that we don't look out for one another. That's some, like some other countries do. I'm gonna wholeheartedly reject that today for the state of Nevada. I refuse to believe what they're saying about Americans and about Nevadans. I refuse to believe that we do not love our neighbors as we love ourselves. I refuse to believe that we do not care about the poor among us. I refuse to believe that we cannot live in harmony with one another. Some Nevadans have been affected by the virus more than others and others have faced economic challenges brought on by this pandemic. No matter challenges we're facing individually, we face them all together and collectively as Nevadans. Nevada will make it through this, and how well we do will be determined by how much we care for one another, especially those who are the hardest hit. We have to keep fighting to get this under control. Before we get to the media question and answer session, I just wanted to note, According to our latest statistics, Nevada is testing positive for COVID every 40 seconds. That's 45 cases in 30 minutes. Approximately the time frame I've been speaking to you, and every hour and 15 minutes, Nevada dies from COVID. The virus is pre still pre prevalent in our communities. Please protect yourselves and one another by continuing to wear your mask, wash your hands frequently, and practice social distancing. Together, we can help stem the tide. God bless you all. I think my staff will now help facilitate some questions and answers with members of the media on the call. Megan, are you there? Yes, Governor, thank you. Again, if we could uh, utilize the raise hand function on Zoom, um, and if we could keep our cameras off for the whole time, I'll call on you and you should be able to unmute yourself. We'll go to Megan Messerly of the Nevada Independent for the first question, Megan. Hi, Governor, thanks for doing this. I just wanted to ask, uh, with the holidays coming up, is it safe for people to travel to Nevada over the holidays, including to Las Vegas for New Year's Eve? Why or why not? Well, we have the same restrictions in people uh, in place for people that are traveling to Nevada over the, holi over the holiday period, that they practice uh, our protocols, that they respect our protocols, that they wear a mask, that they practice social distancing, that they avoid large gatherings. If they do so, we feel that everybody can be safe. If they don't want to follow those protocols and they refuse to be part of the solution, then they should probably stay home. Safety is a partnership with us, with our resort community, and with our visitors. We need everybody to do their part. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Governor. We'll go to Colton Lockhead of the Las Vegas Review Journal for the next question. Colton. Hey, Governor, can you hear me? Governor, hello. We can hear you, Colton. Go ahead. All right. So we've been under the pause for about three weeks now. Uh, 
Do you and your team believe that the current mitigation measures are working to slow the spread, given the continued spread of the virus, increased in deaths, hospitalizations, and other metrics? I apologize, Colin. I didn't hear the first part of your, your question. Could you ask me one more time? Yeah, so we've been under the pause for about three weeks now uh, with these current stricter measures. Do you and your team believe that these current mitigation measures are working to slow the spread given the metrics that we're seeing in that time? Obviously, we've seen numbers increase over this time, but I do feel that the mitigation measures are, are working. I mean, but for these uh, measures that we've got, I think our numbers would be a lot higher than they currently are. The majority of Nevadans are practicing uh, the protocols, they're wearing a mask, they are uh, practicing social distancing. But as a study at the University of Washington showed, if we could go from 74% compliance to 95% compliance, we'd save a thousand lives between now and April. That would affect a lot of families. So they're working, but we need more of it. Thank you, Colton. Thank you, Governor. We'll go to the next question. Madison, uh, I believe the last name is McKay. Madison? Hi, Governor. Governor, thank you so much for your time. Um, now that the pause is being extended until January, is there anything you have to say to businesses that are struggling right now, any support from your end, despite the, you know, the lack of federal assistance right now? Well, you know, I understand how businesses feel. We're doing everything we can to protect the businesses and to protect the customers of those businesses. And I encourage them to contact. Uh, our delegation is working to help us with the federal assistance but we have to do what we can. Safety is a priority for all of us. That's what we are focusing on. We're hopeful that you know, this extension will, will get us where we need to go with the combination of the extension, the uh, protocols that are still in place and the vaccines that are coming. We're hopeful we'll be in a better place by the time this would expire. Thank you, Madison, and thank you, Governor. We'll go to Brian Hoffman from KTVN for the next question, Brian. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, so I got a two part question for you. One, when uh, that uh, pause does expire, what type of regulations could we possibly be looking at? And have you reached out or spoken with the incoming uh, um, president, uh, uh, Joe Biden, about receiving possible uh, extended federal assistance? I want to get into the hypotheticals about, you know, what we could put into place uh, after the end of the uh, third to one month extension of the pause. That'll depend on our numbers at the time and what the situation is. Uh, as it relates to the vice president and uh, our vice president elect Biden and uh, Kamala Harris, we have been in discussion with their teams. They understand the difficulty that we're facing, but you've got to understand they're going to be off in office for five weeks. That's a long time from now that we have to hang on for. And we need something done and we need something done now. It's an open invitation to anybody that doesn't think there's a need to come on out here and I'll take you through our hospitals and our businesses that are suffering and our schools where we still don't have kids in the classrooms to show that the need is real. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for the question. We'll go, um, I believe it's Jay Jones. It says Jay's Galaxy um, S10, but I believe it's Jay Jones from the Los Angeles Times. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me, Governor? Uh, yeah, I'm trying. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, happy holidays to you and yours. Um, with Christmas less than two weeks away, no public official wants to be a Scrooge, throwing more people out of work and increasing the financial pain here in our state. But that said, last week, the daily number of new COVID cases in Clark County, Nevada, per capita, was higher than the number in Los Angeles County, California which is in a much stricter lockdown situation over, ordered by Governor Newsom. I understand you're on a tightrope as you described earlier this afternoon, but given Nevada's COVID numbers and the soaring volume, doesn't public health outweigh the certainly understandable economic impact? Well, public health includes a lot of things. It certainly includes a COVID diagnosis, but includes the mental health that people are facing the homelessness that they're facing, the food uh, shortages that they're facing. We are in a unique position in Nevada. We are reliant on one industry, our hospitality and tourism industry. We don't have uh, the IT industry. We don't have manufacturing in Southern Nevada. You know, we don't have a diversified economy like other states do. Our economy is basically reliant on hospitality 
and people coming here to have a good time and enjoy themselves. And when you talk about the health crisis that it could provide, you've got to balance the health crisis as it relates to COVID diagnosis with, as I said, the use of opioids and fentanyl deaths have increased 50% quarter over quarter. And some of that has to be attributed to the lockdown situation and the restrictions that are in place. So we're trying to take all of those uh, criteria and statistics into account when we come up with the plan. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Jay, for the question. Um, we have time for a few more. I am monitoring both the chat and the raise hand function. So we'll go to Astrid Mendez with Channel 13 next. Astrid? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. As it was mentioned, Christmas is about to be happening. And even though with the moratorium, we know that some families have been getting those um, notices that they need to bake it as soon as possible. Obviously, one thing that you just mentioned right now is that it's important for families to stay together and to stay inside to avoid more COVID cases. What should families do or who should they talk to or contact in case that they're still faced with an eviction, in even with the extension then and the reinstatement of the moratorium that you just basically announced? Well, you're right. The, the eviction moratorium will be signed tomorrow. Details will be coming with the moratorium, with the directive that we signed tomorrow and will provide instruction in terms of what they should do. But when you talk about Christmas being two weeks away, I want to add a little something. You're right. Christmas is less than two weeks away. And the best gift you can give your family is their health. And we can all give each other a gift of health by practicing these protocols, by wearing the mask, by avoiding large gatherings, by washing your hands. And to say, look, this year we're not going to be able to get together for that big Christmas dinner. And I'm, I'm giving you the gift. We're going to make it next year. We're going to all make it through this together. And next year we'll be able to get together for Christmas dinner. So that's the best gift that you can give your family and your friends. Thank you, Governor. We'll go to Howard from CDC Gaming. Howard. Governor, how are you doing today? Thanks for the conference call. Thanks for uh, the presser. Um, you, I took what you said about the gaming industry, you know, not shut, not closing the casinos to heart. I, I guess the question is, did you, have you had discussions with the, you know, different operators, the casino leaders about this? And, you know, you see what's happening. A lot of properties are shutting down um, hotels midweek or restaurants. They're, they're rolling back on their own. They're not waiting for um, like in Pennsylvania or Illinois or, um, um, Ohio, you know, other states that have closed down. So obviously you didn't want to close down. You're kind of leaving it up to the, seems to be leaving it up to the operators to make these decisions. Each of the operators make their own decisions and they're governed by the Gaming Control Board who I have total confidence in, uh, in terms of uh, providing us with restrictions and criteria for them to operate under. Every state is different. Again, you have to understand that Nevada, this is our only uh, big industry that we have in Southern Nevada. So it's incumbent upon us to do what we can to protect them. I'm thinking of the hundreds of thousands of employees that work in these properties that are affected by this. As I said, I don't, I'm not concerned about the stock price of you know, some of these properties. I'm concerned about how the individual employees are impacted and affected by the virus and by the shutting down of the uh, strip. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Howard, for the question. We will go to um, David from 8 News Now. Uh, David? Governor, I hope you can hear me there. Um, thank you for taking my question. My question is about uh, the vaccine and how to uh, how we're moving forward with that. With that, obviously, it's long awaited. Uh, we've heard a lot from state officials about the tiers one, two, and three. I'm curious, though, what you had to say for the majority of us who are in that final tier, who are going to have to hold out until we get a large amount of the vaccine to come, you know, in the spring and what your message is for, for the majority of us who won't be vaccinated right away. Well, my message to the majority of people that won't be receiving it and, uh, and, and it's unfortunate we can't get more and we're doing everything we can as a state to, to increase our allocation and to get our allocation up is that continue to protect yourself by practicing the protocols. If you wear a mask, you wash your hands, you practice social distancing, you avoid large groups, you're gonna be in a safer position. And as more and more people get vaccinated, 
there'll be less likely of exposure that you will be receiving as a result of others being vaccinated. But it's going to take some time for the state of Nevada, for the entire country to get a vaccine. And we need to be as patient as we can along the way. Uh, there's hope that this week the FDA is looking at Moderna, which is going to be more vaccines that they're going to be providing. And we would be getting a, our share of those too. And we're hopeful that we'll get as many as possible in the weeks and months ahead. But for those who are later along the tiers, in terms of getting the vaccine, continue to practice the protocols that we've put in place. Thank you, Governor. And thank you, David, for the question. We have time for a couple more. We'll go to Lauren Clark from Channel 3. Lauren, you're up next. Hi there, Governor. Thank you so much for the time. Um, my question is also vaccine related. As you know, there's still some people who don't necessarily have full trust in this vaccine right now. Will, will your office be doing anything in terms of education, encouraging people to go out and get it? We will be doing as much as we possibly can with our medical facilities, with our doctors on the front line, in terms of describing just how safe this vaccine is. I mean, it's been thoroughly vetted. Our Western states have vetted it a second time. They've approved it. The vaccine should be here tomorrow. And I would have no problem, whether it would be my mother, my sister, my kids, my wife, anyone getting the vaccine. I'm confident in the safety and the efficacy of the vaccines. It would encourage people to take part and receive the vaccine. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. We'll do the last question from Sam Metz. If we weren't able to grab your question today, please feel free to send me an email or a text after this. So we'll do um, Sam Metz from the AP um, to go next. And Astrid uh, Mendez, if you don't mind just keeping your camera off. Uh, Sam, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Governor. Thanks for doing this. When you talk about a bridge, how long do you anticipate the bridge being? I assume we don't know exactly, but should businesses and residents assume that the bridge with all the restrictions it entails, lasts until midsummer when the vaccine's widely distributed? Till midsummer, Sam, but you've got to understand when this started back in March, and I made the decision that we had to shut down, you know, our casinos and our businesses and our schools, I never thought that we would be here nine months later, facing a lot of the same problems in the situation that we have. It is my hope that uh, as people continue to follow the protocols that we put in place, that they wear a mask, that they wash their hands, that they practice social distancing, they avoid large groups, they help us protect from any surges coming from Christmas or New Year's, that we'll be able to keep our numbers low and let the healthcare system catch up. When you couple that with the fact that vaccines are, are here tomorrow or Tuesday, and we'll start vaccinating people and that they will then be uh, immune, hopefully after the second vaccine from, from the uh, virus, that you know less people will be co potential carriers and we can get these numbers down. But as I said last time I had you all together, we're much closer to the end of this pandemic than we are to the beginning. And I still feel that way today. We are closer to the end than we are in the beginning and there are, there's hope on the horizon. But if we work together, what I said, I believe, I don't believe what you hear out there. I believe that Nevadans care about their neighbors like they care about themselves. I believe that Nevada cares about our homeless population. I ne believe Nevadans care about those that are less fortunate. We need to practice that as we move forward. And hopefully when I see you next time in the middle of January, if not before, we'll be able to have some uh, positive, more positive news coming your way. Thank you, everyone. If we weren't able to get to your question today, please feel free to shoot me an email. We thank you all for sticking around. I know this is a little bit longer than our press conferences normally go. Um, so again, thank you for your time today. We'll have some more information out tonight and tomorrow regarding the governor's announcements. Um, if you have any additional questions, just feel free to reach out. Thank you, Governor. Mm -hmm. And that was the latest update on the Nevada's coronavirus response from the governor. He announced that the recent restrictions he put in place three weeks ago will now be extended until January 15th. We, of course, will have more on this tonight at 5. You can also catch up on the latest at KTNV.com.